Good morning, and welcome to our worship service at First Unitarian Society of Ithaca. Spring is upon us with beautiful days and dark wet ones. We here at First Unitarian are nurturing our connections, ever seeking inspiration, and hopeful for light and health. My name is Jennifer Stridemullen, and I'm the Celebration Associate today. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to everyone, whether you are new newcomers or longtime attendees, members of the Ithaca community, or watching from another place. We are so glad you have chosen to be with us. Please check your email, our Facebook page, and our website for more information about how to create connections. If you'd like to receive weekly updates describing opportunities for engagement, please email a request to office at uuithaca.org. Our service this morning has been pre-recorded, but we look forward to sharing the service broadcast on Sunday morning and seeing you at the live coffee hour that follows. The theme for the month of May is story, which will be reflected in the music, readings, and sermons. As for announcements, the Living the Pledge workshop is alive and well in Ithaca. Some 45 of us have attended the workshop, and those of us who have are gathering next Saturday for a session to touch base about our individual progress in fighting racism. We are also planning for another workshop in September. Email the office if you would like to be put on the list. Our congregational annual meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, May 26, so mark that on your calendars too. Also, a big save the date. We are having an in-person gathering on Sunday, June 13th for a farewell to Reverend Margaret. We will gather at Stewart Park and be consistent with COVID guidelines, so we may need to have several smaller groups, but save the date, that's June 13th, and stay tuned. Our opening words this morning are from my colleague, Reverend Marta Valentin. In gatherings, we are stirred, like the leaves of the fall season rustling around sacred trees, tossed hither and yon until we come to rest together, quietly, softly. We come to gather strength from each other. We come to give strength to each other. We come to ask for strength from the spirit of all that is and is not. When our hearts sing or they frown, it is the way of compassion telling us to give. It is the way of peace telling us to share our gifts, for we are happiest and most powerful when love is made apparent in and through us. Spirit of the circle that is love, as we twirl in this dance that is life, we give thanks for reminding us each day of our task of ministering to each other. With a searching glance, a safe touch, a generous smile, a thoughtful word. Thank you for reminding us that we are always building our beloved comunidad. Thank you for reminding us that through our covenant with you, we covenant with each other and are made whole. In gratitude, we celebrate with open hearts and minds. We discover who we are, separate from each other and within one another. In this circle that holds all life, may we ever work toward widening its boundaries until there are none. Amen. Paz. Blessed be. Whoever you are, Whoever you love, wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. Here you belong. This morning's chalice lighting words come from the International Council of Unitarians and Universalists. These words are offered by Mio Kubuayo Jean Bosco, leader of the Assemblée de Chrétiens Unitarian de Burundi, the Unitarian Church of Burundi. Welcome into this holy time. How do people accept adversity that comes upon their lives? We light this chalice, being conscious that our nature expects much good to happen, yet this does not prevent strong winds from striking us without any clear cause. Fire falls upon our possessions and consumes everything. 
and we find ourselves more hopeless than ever. That moment of despair separates us from our friends, our employees, our communities, even our families, because we cannot meet their expectations. It is the time we curse instead of offering blessing. This is the time, this, the same time we judge instead of listen. In the time of despair, we isolate ourselves instead of expressing our thoughts and feelings. May this chalice sustain us, though the wind has struck us hard, though fire has fallen on us. May it bring us together. May this chalice be a symbol of unity, hope, and blessing. Amen. Friends, I am so glad to join you on this day of celebration. Too often, one single dominant vision of family crowds out the many other forms that families take. Stories help correct that. They help us celebrate the many diverse forms of family and affirm the beauty of our own unique family form. It's time now to open our small dated packets marked 5-9 or May 9th. Let's see what's in here. Inside, you should have found, get mine out, a flower. Today is Mother's Day. It's also called Mama's Day in honor of all of the colors, roles, and diversity of mamas and all the hard work they do. Sometimes it's easy to think of only one kind of Mother's Day, the one described by all of the cards that are available but as you use, we recognize that there are all kinds of mothering and all kinds of folks who mother. Today, we tell stories about all the kinds of families and all the kinds of mothering that happens in the world. First, let's honor those who mother by saying their names out into the world. And if they are there with you, give them a big hug and tell them how much they mean to you. Now that we've done that, I'm going to share a story with you called In Our Mother's House by Patricia Polacco, with permission by Penguin Random House Publishing. In Our Mother's House. When my mothers told me about how they brought me home to live with them shortly after I was born, their eyes would shine and glisten and they'd grin from ear to ear. They told me about how they had walked across dry, hot deserts, sailed through turbulent seas, flew over tall mountains and trekked through fierce storms just to bring me home. Then they'd get tears in their eyes when they'd tell me what it was like to hold me in their arms for the very first time. Three years after I was born, my brother Will came to us. He was so tiny, just three days old. Then there was Millie. We always kidded that our mothers found her under a lily pad in an enchanted pond deep in a hidden forest. 
She became part of our family when she was two months old, three years after Will had come. Our mothers were so different from each other that all of us often wondered how they found each other at all. Mima was short and stout. Her family was Italian, so she loved to cook. And she loved to sew upstairs on a noisy old machine. Mima was a pediatrician, and whenever any of us got sick, she always knew exactly what to do to make us feel better. Marmy was tall and thin. She could fix just about anything and organized everything. She made lists, posted chores on the refrigerator, and kept the house so clean and tidy. We used to kid her that if we got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, she'd make our beds before we could climb back into them. Marmy was a paramedic who rode in an ambulance. Whenever there was any kind of emergency, she always remained calm and took charge. Our mothers loved to laugh. Mima's whole body shook when she laughed. Marmy laughed almost silently, but she laughed so hard that she'd practically fall down and go limp. Our mother's house was always alive with music, all kinds. Sometimes our mothers would put on old rock and roll or swing records and get all of us to dance with them. This is Holly Gully, Mima would sing out. Once she flapped her arms like wings and clucked the chicken dance. This is Bebop, Marmy said as she grabbed Will and spun him around, then dipped him backward. We laughed and laughed. We lived in a big old brown shingle house on Woolsey Street in Berkeley, California, that was set back from the street. When we walked into our mother's house, the first thing we saw was the staircase. All of us slid down the banisters. Once, Will was sliding so fast that he couldn't stop at the bottom. He flew off and took the finial with him. In the living room, the old clinker brick fireplace was the heart of our home. Sometimes Marmy and Mima would pop corn in it, and we'd all sit, eat popcorn and apples, and share stories. It was Millie's favorite place to be. I remember when she was about two, she got up in the middle of the night. We found her the next morning asleep in the hearth, covered with charcoal. She had taken a piece of charcoal and drawn all over the nearby wall. We couldn't take our eyes off her drawing. It was so beautiful. If we hadn't known it before, we knew then just how magical Millie was. Well, my little sparrow, Mima finally whispered, looks like you are a magnificent artist. The most favored place for us kids was the sunroom above the carport. That is where all of our toys lived. It was where we played dress up and where every Halloween costume we wore began. No store-bought costumes for us. Marmy and Millie designed them and Mima would help us sew them. One year we went as wild animals. Hardly any of our neighbors recognized us. That is, except for Mrs. Lochner. She knew us all right. She glared at us when she opened the door. She glared at our mothers, too. Her kids came running and were really excited to see us, but Mrs. Lochner turned her back and shut the door. What's the matter with her? Will blurted out. But our mother said nothing and continued down the block. Even so, it was one of the best Halloweens we ever had. We even won the Claremont Avenue costume contest that year. Our upstairs bathroom was almost big enough to hold our entire family at one time. It almost did, too. I remember the night that all of us kids came down with the flu. All at once. Mima and Marmy were darting between each of our rooms. Will, Millie, and I were throwing up. Our mothers changed sheets, washed pajamas, and bathed our foreheads with a cool washcloth. I loved how soft their hands were when they touched my face and wiped away my tears. After two days of utter misery, our mothers announced that they had a surprise for us. This should make you feel better, Marmy sang out. We opened our eyes and there they stood, holding two adorable puppies. When those puppies started jumping about and licking our faces, we all squealed with joy. We finally named them Miso and Wasabi. One of the best things about our mother's house was the tree house that we built in the backyard. Practically the entire neighborhood helped us. It all started with Will, who, like Marmy, was always building things. One Saturday, he found some plans for a tree house in a magazine and went to her. It took several weekends to finish, but the Saturday that we did finish it, everyone stood in a circle around the treehouse. Marmy and Mima broke a bottle of soda over the door jam and named the treehouse Thistle House. That night, all of us kids got to sleep there. Even the Lochner kids were invited, but their parents came and got them. 
They barely spoke to us, just pulled them down the driveway. They just plain didn't like us, I guessed. I couldn't quite understand why. We always tried to be respectful and friendly, the way our mothers taught us to be. The kitchen in our mother's house was the center of everything that was happening in our ho household. The kitchen doorway was where us kids got measured each year. Mima and Marmy's handwriting is still there, even now. And all of our family holidays began in the kitchen. Our grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins usually came for the weekend. Our Italian grandpa, our Nono, was in charge of cooking. We all loved gnocchi. We'd all help him unload the perfect Roma tomatoes, the oxtails, the pork shanks, and the beef brisket. We peeled onions, shaved and diced carrots, and chopped fresh herbs from the garden. After the sauce had been cooking for most of the day, all of us stood at the kitchen island. Nono made a well in the middle of a hill of flour and broke several eggs into it. Then he riced the very hot boiled potatoes right into the flour well. He'd shake his hands from the heat of it as he kneaded the volcano of flour, eggs, and potatoes into a dough. Then Marmy and Mima rolled the dough into long tubes. Millie and Will got to cut them into small pillows. Then I ran each pillow over the back of a floured fork. Nono dropped the gnocchi into boiling water. When they floated to the top, they were done. Sauce and potato dumplings were dished up, salads were made, and baguettes of French bread from the bakery were carried to the table, where we were all so ready to eat. At our table, we didn't only eat, though. Marmy and Mima made sure of that. Everyone talked about everything. Politics, sports, music, and art. Their voices got louder and louder. Opera was always playing in the background. Then they'd all burst into laughter that shook the table. Nono would pound his fist and laugh the loudest. What I loved the most about our family was that we could all speak our hearts. We never measured words. After dinner, all of us kids would sit on the stairs with our grandparents. This is when they'd tell us about when they were young in the old country. It was the best part of the day. Marmy and Mima would listen in and smile. One of the niftiest things that happened in our neighborhood was the Woolsey Street Block Party. Marmy organized it. It became a tradition. For that first one, Millie and I made all of the invitations by hand, and Mima took us around to deliver them from door to door. Everyone was invited. When we stopped at the Lochner's house, their mother glared at us the way she always did. Why doesn't that lady like us, Mima? I asked my mother. She just smiled at me and hugged me up. I like you, baby, she said, and we went on our way. The day of our big block party arrived. Each of the houses on the street had to invent some sort of game in their front yard. The Maguires across the street had a landmine contest. A blindfolded player had to pick his way past marshmallow mines while a caller warned him where they were. The Goldsteins had a penny toss on saucers. The Brooks family had a dunk tank. A lot of fathers got dunked that day. The Abdullahs had a fishing booth. I think our family had the best game of all, a miniature golf course. Will, Marmy, and I put it together. We lashed together old rain gutters with traps and obstacles that had to be putted around in order to get to the end, a flower pot buried to the top. It was Marmy's great idea. Aren't we all something, Mima said when she saw our food court. On our street, everyone was so different. That's what Mima meant. So the Marditians brought stuffed grape leaves and ground lamb. The Polos brought spanakopita and Greek salads. The Abdullahs brought hummus and tabbouleh. Nono made a huge pot of spaghetti and fried schnitzel. The Yamagakis brought sushi, which I liked a lot, but Mima passed it up for fried clams and crawdads and corn on the cob, which the barbers had made. At the end of the day, when everyone was cleaning up and getting ready to sit in our backyard and just talk, Mima looked up to see Mrs. Lochner coming down the street. The Lochners had been invited, but hadn't come. She planted her feet squarely in front of our mothers. I don't appreciate what you two are, she snarled at Mima and Marmy. Will and Millie came running up. I froze where I was. Mrs. Lochner wheeled and stalked off. What's the matter with her, Mama? What's the matter with her? Millie kept saying. All the neighbors closed in on us. She is full of fear, sweetie. 
She's afraid of what she cannot understand. She doesn't understand us, Mima said quietly. There seems to be no love in her heart, either, whispered Marmee. The neighbors agreed. The Mardicians, the Polos, the Yamagakis, the Kiernans, the Goldsteins, the Abdullahs, everybody. And one by one, they hugged our mothers. Then they all stayed and talked and talked until late that night, thanking Mima more than once for thinking up the block party. There wasn't a day in my life that I didn't feel deeply loved and wanted by Mima and Marmee. Our mothers were willing to do anything for us. We knew that. Here's what I mean. One day, Millie and I ran all the way home from school and came tumbling into the kitchen with news. Mima, Mima, we've been picked to host the mother-daughter tea this year, we squealed, jumping up and down. Well, what an honor, Mima said, looking at Marmee. That means we're going to have the tea here, I trumpeted, and, I looked at Mima and Marmee, you both will have to wear long dresses and with big picture hats. All the mothers will be dressed like that, Millie added quickly. Mima and Marmee looked at each other and shrugged. We had never seen either of them in a dress. Ever. Okay, they finally said. Well, okay. <laughs> this was going to be a first. Mima sewed three whole nights to finish not only their dresses, but Millie's and mine as well. The garden was decorated, tables rented and set. A string quartet was hired, and our mothers had the affair catered by our no-no. After Millie and I got dressed, we waited at the bottom of the stairs for our mothers. We could hardly wait to see them. Then they appeared at the top of the stairway. We both caught our breath. They floated down like shimmering swans. As uncomfortable as they must have been, they looked beautiful. The tea was glorious. Everybody commented on how elegant everything was. My heart still skips a beat when I think of the two of them trying so hard to please us in those awkward, sweeping, ridiculous dresses. How we loved them for doing this just for us. From the day we entered our mother's house, they prepared us for the day that we would leave it. I was the first when I left to go away to medical school. Then Will le left to study engineering. Our Millie went all the way to New York to become a fashion designer. Of course, our hearts never left our mother's house. And over the years, Will, Millie, and I returned to be married in the garden, back under Thistle House. We celebrated holidays together there, sang at birthday parties there, cried together when we lost our grandparents. When the three of us had our babies, all of them took their first steps in front of that clinker brick fireplace in their living room. They fell into the waiting arms of their grandmothers, just as we had done. We watched our mothers grow old together in that house. They passed away within a year of each other. Will, Millie, and I placed them together in a green hillside overlooking the bay very near the place where they pledged their love to each other so many years ago. Will and his family live in our mother's house now. We were so pleased that it didn't go to a stranger, and it is still a gathering place for all of us and our families. The walls still whisper our mother's names. All of our hearts find peace whenever we are there, not only remembering them, but being there together in our mother's house. Thank you so much for sharing in this story with me. How does it feel to hear a story about love and diversity? I feel joy and gratitude for all of the mothers out there. So thank you and happy Mother's Day. Each week we create a space in our worship together as a communal spiritual practice. We lift up the names and circumstances that call for our joy and our celebration and for our concern and our sorrow. This week, I lift up those who are struggling with loss, loss of loved ones or important life milestones or health or well-being, loss of those we love. And I lift up all those who are celebrating, celebrating new life, the coming of spring, 
the ways that we have been shaped by our communities. And in this difficult time for many of us, I lift up those who are dealing with illness of the body or the mind, struggling with unsafe home lives or broken relationship. As we find our way together through this life, may we stay true to our most closely held beliefs, our deepest values. May we all be well and safe and cared for. If you're watching this service in its live format, I invite you to type a joy or a sorrow into the chat box so that we might hold it together in this community. Or I invite you to speak it aloud or just hold it silently in your heart. May we trust that these joys, these sorrows, these times of good and bad are all held in the universe and held by each of us in community, that we may feel the love and compassion that dwells there. At the beginning of our live coffee hour each week, we will have a facilitator who will offer space for the sharing of joys and sorrows. And my prayer is that we will all continue to engage in the communal spiritual practice of listening deeply, of offering our care and our compassion to one another. Now holding in our hearts the joys and sorrows of our lives, let us continue in some moments of reflection and prayer. I offer these words by my colleague, Reverend Evan Carvel Zemer, who has come and spoken at Fusip before. They are in honor of Mother's Day. Spirit of life. Today, the advertising tells us what to buy for mom. Instead, help us listen and honor the deeper voices. Today, let us honor all those who have made this world possible for us, those who did the hard work of building a better world for future generations. Today, let us honor the grief of those who have lost children through miscarriage, stillbirth, death, those who long for children, and those who, for whatever reason cannot be in touch with their children today. Today, let us honor the grief of those who mourn their parents, whether separated by death, dementia, disconnection. Today, let us honor those who fill in for missing mothering, fathers, grandparents, foster parents, aunts and uncles, and more. Today, let us honor the ways we have each been nurtured and mothered by the mothers who gave birth to us, by the parents who raised us, by those many others who have supported and nurtured us, people of all genders. Today, let us honor those who survived damaging and traumatic mothering. Spirit of life, help them to heal. Let us remember that not every mother is ready for her children. Let us turn aside from the myths of motherhood on a pedestal and remember each parent is an imperfect human in need of more support than adulation, in need of our support. Today, let us honor those who are doing the hard work of nurturing, striving to meet not only the physical needs, but the many deep and complicated emotional and spiritual needs spirit of life, nurture and sustain them so that they may be the nurturers you desire. Today, let us honor all the ways each of us give to tomorrow, knowing there are multiple paths of meaning and more than one way to birth the future. Today, with both joy and sorrow, let us be grateful for life, for the chance to love, for those who love us and the opportunity to nurture the future. May it be so. Amen. Blessed be.
Each week, we take an offering to sustain the important ministries and programs of this congregation and its presence in Ithaca. Giving to the plate is a ritual reminder of that form of love we call generosity. Let it be a reminder that we have enough and that we keep our capacity to give to support this beloved community. The giving information will appear on your screen in a moment during the offertory music. So please give. It's a symbol of our gratitude for this service and our ongoing commitment to support the work of this church. Take a moment and give, either through the text option or the giving button on the home page of the website. May these gifts bring about connection, inspiration, and engagement within these walls and beyond. Our reading this morning is the Mother's Day Proclamation by Julia Ward Howe. Arise then, women of this day. Arise all women who have hearts, whether our baptism be of water or of tears. Say firmly, we will not have the great questions decided by irrelevant agencies. Our husbands will not come to us reeking with carnage for caresses and applause. Our sons shall not be taken from us to unlearn all that we have been able to teach them of charity, mercy, and patience. We, the women of one country, will be too tender of those to another country to allow our sons to be trained to injure theirs. From the bosom of the devastated earth, a voice goes up with our own. It says, disarm, disarm. The sword of murder is not the balance of justice. Blood does not wipe out dishonor, nor violence, violence indicate possession. As men have often forsaken the plow and the anvil at the summons of war, 
Let women now leave all that may be left of home for a great and earnest day of counsel. Let them meet first as women to bewail and commemorate the dead. Let them solemnly take counsel with each other as to the means whereby the great human family can live in peace and each bearing after her own time the sacred impress, not of Caesar, but of God. These words written long, long ago by Julia Ward Howe, who was, by the way, a Unitarian, are a call to lay down arms and promote peace in our lives. This Mother's Day proclamation was written as an appeal, as a prayer to women everywhere to promote peace and love in their lives, their communities, and the world. This holiday, this Mother's Day, which is now celebrated with flowers and brunch, was started as a call for peace and for justice. Now to be clear, I love flowers and I love brunch, and I love a day that celebrates the powerhouses that mothers and all who nurture us are in this world. And I acknowledge that for many of us, this day is complicated. For those with complicated relationships with their mothers or mothers who have died or histories of abuse or neglect, miscarriages, children who have died, incarcerated mothers, the list goes on. Just as any holiday can bring us all sorts of emotions, Mother's Day is no different. It brings its own special kind of pain for so many of us. And I want to invite us to embrace this day as a new opportunity. I want to invite us to reconnect with the radical message from its founding. What might this day be like if it were rooted in a call for justice and for peace. How might that shift our shared experience of it? In her Mother's Day proclamation, Julia Ward Howe calls upon all women to gather and to speak out against the violence and the harm that is coming to their families. We have a similar invitation in our current context. We are living in a time that is aching for us to respond. We're living in a time when the rates of mass incarceration are higher than ever, when the impacts of the climate crisis continue to wreak havoc on our lives, particularly in communities most impacted by poverty, when families are continuing to be uh, separated by unjust immigration laws, when black and brown people are disproportionately murdered by police, when the impact of a cash bail system keeps people, many of them mothers, innocent people, behind bars simply because they cannot afford to get out. When entire countries like India are struggling to breathe in this pandemic because they don't have enough oxygen. We are living in a time that calls for us to address issues of racism, patriarchal oppression, poverty, corruption, and abuse. We're living in a time that calls for us to respond with love and with justice, not the love of greeting cards and flowers, but the fierce love of a constant yearning for equity and justice to prevail. And we are hearing these calls amidst one of the largest mental health crises we've seen in a long time when people are feeling isolated and alone and scared. Last year, when George Floyd was murdered by the police, as he lay on the pavement, he called out for his mother. And it has been said that in those words, he was calling to all mothers, to all of us who care and who nurture and who love fiercely. And so how will we answer? What will be our response? Thankfully, there is no one way to create justice and love in our world. Thankfully, we can each bring ourselves fully to the task. We can show up in our own way. We can respond in a unique 
way to each of us. Some will respond by marching in the streets, some by lobbying for health care reform, a single payer health system. Some will take that money and instead of buying a gift, use it to reduce an innocent person's bail. Some will think creatively about how to offer free childcare during meetings so that mothers and parents can participate fully in church and community life. Some will fight for a living wage for all jobs, for parental leave time when babies are born or when children come into a family. Some of us will respond by participating in the Living the Pledge workshops or showing up for racial justice or handing out Black Lives Matter signs in our neighborhoods. Some will respond by working in the community gardens, by stocking the blue cabinets. Some will have hard conversations with their children about how the world is sometimes unfair and how we can work together to fix it. Because when the call goes out to mothers everywhere, the, co the call is going out to all of us. Whether we have been mothers or want to be mothers or have no desire to be mothers, the call is the reminder that we belong to each other. We are responsible for one another. We are interconnected, whether we like it or not. Our Unitarian Universalist tradition is radical. The word radical comes from Latin meaning forming the root. So it is a word that asks us to go back to our roots. What is at the root of our shared Unitarian Universalist heritage? Our tradition is rooted in fairness, equity, and a call for reason and universal love. Our UU heritage calls us to nurture each other, not because we want to go to heaven or avoid hell, but because we love one another. We should do good because it feels good and multiplies good for our neighbors. This is part of why our Unitarian Universalist Association has become part of the Strong Families Initiative and their annual Mama's Day campaign. This effort is aligned more closely with the call from Julia Ward Howe that we heard earlier today, words that echo from so long ago. This Mama's Day is an effort rooted in peace and justice for all of us. The Mama's Day campaign celebrates trans mamas, immigrant mamas, single mamas, lesbian mamas, young mamas, poor mamas, biological and chosen mamas, adoptive mamas, all the mamas everywhere. The celebration is rooted in policy change and acknowledgement of the struggles that mamas and caregivers everywhere experience is a more expansive celebration of the power and the courage of mamas, of all of us, to be more radical in our approach to relationship. So today, as we are invited once again to celebrate the mamas, the caregivers, the nurturers in our lives, let us expand our hearts and our minds. Let us welcome a celebration of all those who have loved us deeply and nurtured us into being. Let us honor the mamas who have died, the mamas who are not well, who are incarcerated, who are unable to be the mamas they want to be. Let us honor those who have shown up when our mamas couldn't. The grandparents and aunties and uncles and cousins and siblings and friends the list goes on. Let us honor the courage and the spirit of power that lives in all who are doing the best we can amidst the oppressive powers of capitalism, patriarchy, and racism. Let us take a deep breath amidst this hard, hard year. Let us work for reproductive justice and remind the world that we are all worthy of adequate health care. And let us take a moment to breathe, to give thanks, to send the card, to make the pancakes, to place the flowers so carefully in the vase, to pause and to give thanks and deep gratitude 
to the mamas in our lives and to continue on striving toward a world where all have enough and all are respected, protected, and able to thrive. So may it be. Amen. And blessed be. As we extinguish our chalices, we do not let go of the hope and courage that they represent. We go forth from this place, carrying with us our sense of wonder, our sense of imagination, our yearning for a world made just and loving. We carry our promise to work for love and compassion for all, and we carry it out into this beautiful and broken world. Our service has ended. Let our true service now begin. Go in peace. Thank mm-hmm. you.